Well, the first I ever heard of Sylvia was there was an art competition, would you believe, when I don't know, I might have been 10 or some such. And uh, this was in Strumness. And so I would enter this competition and I thought this was just wonderful. Anyway, Sylvia won this competition. And even at that age, I could see she was good. But I didn't actually meet her at that point, I don't think. Sylvia was always a very private kind of person. And then I discovered that um, she was coming to art school. One of the teachers told me that she was going to be joining the class, but she came, I think, after Christmas in the first year. So that's when I met her. And, uh, uh, well, you know, we had something in common coming from Orkney, but I didn't get to be really pally with her at that point. Maybe in the second year or even into the third year, uh, Sylvia and I got a flat together, uh, Springbank Terrace, and uh, a semi-basement flat. And that's where Sylvia started doing these window paintings. And there were lace curtains on the window, uh, which was ground level at that point, um, looking through the, the curtains and through the window into this sort of garden area. I really got to know Sylvia when we moved up here, built the house up here, because Sylvia's about half a mile up the brae from here, um, looking out over the flow. And uh, so, you know, walking dogs would be walking past her house. And that's probably how we got to know her, I think. Um, she was a very easy person to know. Um, I think Grace was was the first stop for island students in general. I mean, I went to Grace, and uh, there are a number of significant artists here in the Isles just now who were taught by Sylvia. Um, they all hold her in very high respect, all very fond of her as a person, not just as a teacher or an artist. And she, Sylvia was never much into clothes or decoration, but she did like a nice big clunky ring. <laughs> in fact, she that was quite a story. She, for whatever reason, took it off and sat it in the top of her car while she was doing something at the car and drove off and came back and it was all crushed. <laughs> so I had to make her another one. <laughs> um, and Sylvia's connection with Aberdeen was really quite deep because um, she was a lecturer at Grey School of Art uh, for a long number of years and um, stayed in um, just outside Ellen um, I, and was back and forth between Orkney and, and uh, Aberdeen all the time. And, and most of the collectors of her work are kind of spread across those two geographic areas as well, but I'm sure there's a great many hidden away in houses yet. You could see how she worked, because if you were visiting Heathery Brace, she would often have a painting. I don't remember her ever using an easel. She had an easel, but she would pin large sheets of paper to the wall and work on them there. So she was kind of living with a painting as she worked it. And she, rather than, you know, spend a day painting, she would go back and forth to the paintings and develop them. And you can see that in the paintings, I think, because those later works are mostly multimedia. So she was reflecting on them and going back to them with another medium, perhaps, or adding another layer of texture. She was always took great deal of time, I would say, to, pay, to do whatever she was doing, very meticulous. And she wasn't sort of influenced by um, what other people were doing. It was very individual, her stuff, always. Visiting Sylvia, you never got that sense of visiting an artist who was busy in the studio. You know, you have this traditional notion of an artist in front of an easel, spattered with paint, you know. Um, if you went to see Sylvia, she would make a pot of tea and you would sit down in front of the window and look out over the flow 
and you were conscious of the fact that the work was being done, but you didn't feel you were in a workspace. Most places are not. You're seeing landscape around you. You know, sitting here, you can see the hills far away, and and Sylvia would have always had a view of some kind. I think there's an underlying, um, you know, ambition to, that Sylvia had for her work. You know, maybe it wasn't wasn't her, but her personal career as an artist. I think, it was, but her ambition for her work was was uh, was very high. I think, and she, you know, she was very aware of um, the history of art and 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 contemporary art. Obviously, she was teaching at Grace, uh, you know, throughout the the 70s and 80s. And I think she, you know, her her vision was to, to, to create work that was of the absolute highest uh, quality, the best she could possibly make it. She, w she was very self-sufficient um, and uh, self-contained, but there were a number of key collaborations in her life that, that aided, aided her in order to, to push her practice forward. She was very self-effacing about her prints. I think she's a wonderful printmaker. I think she was very lucky in having a very good relationship with Arthur. I think Arthur was very significant. Mm -hmm. So when I spoke to her about her prints, she was always talking them down. Um, and you would get the impression that she wasn't pleased with them. But when you look at them, they're wonderful. And I think Maybe they're wonderful because her and Arthur got on so well, because they knew each other so well, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't think she was ever confident enough to be a printmaker independently. I think she needed Michael and Arthur, to, who knew her work really well, to bring the best out of it. A, in one sense, you can say she spent the last 20 years just painting out her window. Um, and that makes it sound like it's really limited, but it isn't at all. I think it has real intellectual depth. Um, I think it's, it still speaks to us very much. Um, if you're talking about landscape, I mean, this is, it's layers and layers of landscape. Um, you looking at these paintings you're aware of tides skies animal life you know they're full of animal life uh, there's a jeer falcon that she saw out her window in one of them um, there's brocken's bull that's the farm next door um, there's hares there's mice all these little things appear um, and they're not forefront you have to look for them um, and then you're seeing the various layers of her vision where, you know, something from inside the house is reflected, uh, um, another window is reflected on the window, which is looking out into Scapa Flow. Uh, I think they're, they're very profound works. Later in life, as Sylvia's health started to fail, she became a fairly regular visitor. Um, she was an avid reader, and so she went through my entire library. We would swap books, and uh, she would come down and uh, demand an espresso coffee. She <laughs> she uh, felt that helped her through the day. So she could speak to anybody, and did. She had no side whatsoever. You know, she'd be chatting away to everybody. Yeah. And very intelligently, too. She was very, very intelligent. I used to read when she... Um, she saw a lot of George Mackay Brown. And I think through George, she got into reading very deep books, you know, philosophy and all that stuff. And, you know, she, she could take it all in and remember it. She was very clever. I remember Sylvia just as 
part of the community, you know, as as a very likable, very intelligent, very well read person who was excellent company. Um, and there were absolutely no airs and graces as an artist. She was very encouraging to young artists and particularly to her students. But I suppose, you know, her community were farmers, housewives, um, just the people she lived with. And uh, she didn't set herself apart in any way. But I think she really found herself as an artist when she came back to Orkney. But Sylvia worked slowly. She destroyed a lot of stuff. Um, when she knew she was dying, she bought a shredder. She'd seen what had happened with George Mackay Brown, I think. And uh, she bought a shredder and she shredded an enormous amount of stuff. So we knew that what was left was work she was proud of. Yeah. And a lot of that went into the Peer Collection. They have a lot of drawings. Mm -hmm. She, uh, uh, this is a story that she brought back from hospital. She was in ARI and she was going up the corridor and she came across one of her paintings. So she was looking at the painting and there was a, a note um, next to the painting which had attributed it to someone else. And Sylvia always carried this little purse bag around her shoulders. And uh, so she took out the pencil and she scored out the name and she wrote in her own name as she would. And somebody came by, a member of staff came by and said, you can't do that. And she said, yes, I can. It's my painting. I don't know what their response was or <laughs> where they went from there, but she was she was kind of smugly happy about this. Uh, it, it appealed to Sylvia. It was very much part of her personality. I think she maybe did realise that she was special. Yeah. And that she had a skill. But she was very, very, you know, she wasn't boastful at all. Or very modest person. More than any other artist, I think she, for me, she's captured not just the landscape, but the essence of living in the Isles. You know, the constantly changing light, the constantly changing water, the the wildlife that's moving through that landscape. I can't think of anybody else who does it better. <laughs>